everybody, I'm Josh. And I'm Aton. Welcome back to the fourth episode of the Younger Half Podcast. We are two 14-year-old boys from New Jersey who discuss, debate, and share insights on everything from history to politics, sports, current events, and more. Our goal is to provide an outspoken voice for the kids of our generation, as well as to voice our passionate and informative opinions in our current times. Follow us on Instagram at The Younger Half. To see more of our podcasts, check us out on Apple Podcasts and Spotify Podcasts and Google Podcasts at The Younger Half. Uh, today we start the career angle. We um, have a very special guest. Um, stick around for that to see who it is. And let's get into it. So President Trump wore a mask for the first time at a military hospital. And it's four months into this pandemic. And health experts and doctors and the CDC have urged people to wear a mask when they go out. And Trump himself has said that masks are optional. And he doesn't seem like he's going to wear one. But he actually did when he went to a hospital. So what do you think about that, Josh? Yeah, I mean, I just think that it's like, it's a little, like, it's a little mind-boggling is is what I'd describe it. I'm not trying to criticize President Trump, but I don't know what he's thinking. You know, it's just, it's just a little, it's confusing because, you know, the CDC recommends that everyone should wear a mask when you're in a public setting and that when you're in a place where it's tough to maintain social distancing. You know, like like you just said, it's four months into the pandemic and it's 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 confusing that it's the first time that he's decided to wear one. So and also that he's just he's just fighting with and contradicting his top his top infectious disease doctor. He's telling him what what to do, what to what the protocols are. He he's the expert. You know, it, it's, it's just, that's all I have to say. It's, it's mind-boggling, like I said before. So, you know? Right. Like, we have all, at least I have, been wearing masks outside. And just to see a leader, like, continually say, don't do it, don't wear a mask, or I'm not going to do it. It's just, it started this whole thing that from, especially Trump supporters and conservatives, saying, oh, we don't need masks. So I think it's a good it's a good step forward for President Trump because now hopefully he'll start getting into wearing a mask yeah, like, and hopefully get other people. Like that. you said before, I think you said it the the perfect word is is leader or, or other words like role model. You know, you're you're the leader of one of the most powerful countries on the planet and you're not wearing a mask during a pandemic when your top infectious disease doctor is telling you that you showed and he's he said himself as a, it's a like a, i think i quote it's it's like a good symbol you know wearing out a good symbol to your right you're the president of the united states you know you're, you're a role model your top infectious disease doctor is telling you, you should you know it's just it's just interesting to know to see yeah so now on to the career angle Thank you so much for coming on to our podcast. What is your name and what is your job? So my name is Emily Erfelding, and I am a physician, and I'm the director of the Division of Microbiology and Infectious Diseases at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. So that institute, NIAID, is part of the National Institutes of Health here in the United States. Wow. So the first question we have is, how did you become, how did you become the director of the Division of Microbiology and Infectious Disease at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. Yeah, so I, I went to medical school um, and became a, a doctor. Um, and then I did a residency in internal medicine and in a fellowship in infectious diseases. So my specialty became treating patients and, you know, working on problems related to infectious diseases. So that was what I did for about... 14 years at an academic um, medical center. And uh, I was faculty in the School of Medicine. And then I moved to work for the NIH, first in the um, Division of AIDS, which is part of NIAID also. So our focus there was HIV, so one pathogen. And then a couple of years ago, I guess about three and a half years ago, I became the division director, um, for my current division, which um, focuses on all the other path research on all the other pathogens. So everything that's not HIV, um, you know, so coronavirus, so bacteria, other viruses, um, malaria, parasites, 
that's all it um it's all our responsibility in at DMED, D, the Division of Microbiology and Infectious Disease. So that was that's my that was my path um to getting here. Right. All right. So um how is how has the focus of your work changed during the current pandemic? Well I would say before um and I guess that would be last year in 2019, you know, I probably spent more time on certain pathogens that were, you know, the big killers like tuberculosis and right. malaria. I mean, more time planning research programs that are dealing with problems, figuring out how we're going to solve those problems, convening workshops with other um, scientists, that sort of thing. I would say that, so, you know, it was pretty balanced with <laughs> what we needed to do. Um, but since COVID has come along um, and become a pandemic and clearly, you know, maybe turned into the biggest um, infectious disease threat of our lifetimes, I think, I probably spend more than 95% of my time on things related to coronavirus. So developing a vaccine, testing a vaccine in clinical trials, um, trying to develop new diagnostics, trying to do the early work in identifying new therapeutics, supervising the people that are running the clinical trials and new therapeutics, talking to people that have new ideas on what we can do in vaccines and, and diagnostics and therapeutics. Uh, so that's what I do, you know, more than 95% of my time now. And it's, it's a lot of pressure, um, but we are making progress, I think. Okay. And, uh, we just need to keep going. Right. So uh, you are a doctor. The, real the reality is that politics affects the work that you do. Can you talk a little about that and what some of the challenges you face is in that regard? So I think, you know, primarily my job is in public health research. Um, so public health, you know, big populations, money from in the government that gets appropriated by Congress. Obviously, that got some political overtones, but I would say every, every physician, even, you know, when I was seeing patients with infectious diseases in my earlier days, I mean, we still struggled with issues like people that don't have insurance or don't have adequate insurance, um, how, how they're going to get um, the care that they need. So I think every physician probably has some, um, deals with politics in some way or political issues that are in the forefront of our political discourse here in this country. But now that I work for the government in, um, you know, in a big funding area for public health research, I think, you know, we have to work with um, giving Congress the information they need to come up with a budget every year and appropriations for the NIH and for infectious disease research specifically, uh, probably throughout the course of the year. We get a lot of requests from congressional staffers for more information on what we're doing in specific areas and what we're planning on doing or what we would do, for example, if we got, you know, an additional specific appropriation for that area. Um, sometimes we have to prepare, you know, usually it's the leaders at NIH, the institute directors or the NIH director specifically, we have to help them prepare their, um, their testimony for congressional hearings on a particular issue. Sometimes that's just generally related to the budget, but sometimes it's very particularly related to a, a problem um, in the United States. So there's been a lot of COVID-19 hearings over the past several months, and, and it, in my role would probably be to help my institute director, Dr. Fauci, um, get the information that he needs for, for the congressional members. So that's all political. Um, and then Sometimes we also have to talk to uh, members of the executive branch about particular issues that, they, that they're considering maybe making an area of emphasis. Um, you know, before, before the COVID pandemic, it was, you know, tick-borne diseases and Lyme disease, or what else can we do in this area that seems to be an a, um, evolving problem? All of those things, I guess, also had political overtones. So, Everything, yeah, there's a lot of politics. Um, and there's a lot of interaction with uh, with people, both politically appointee, political appointees in the administration and with people who are elected to Congress and their staff. Right. Okay. Um, so 
what makes COVID-19 different from other pandemics and epidemics? Yeah, I think the biggest issue, the biggest characteristic of um, this disease, this virus, SARS-CoV-2, is that it's highly contagious. And it appears that people can spread it even when they have either no symptoms at all or very minimal symptoms. So they wouldn't you know, feel like they needed to stay in bed because they were sick. So that just means the transmission, the potential for transmission is great, even when people, because people don't know that they, that they might be infectious to others. And then the other feature of it is that, you know, it, it spilled over into humans from probably from an animal reservoir and humans had virtually no immunity to it because it was totally new virus for us. So that just means that pretty much the entire global population, um, at least when it spilled over into the humans, the entire global population was probably susceptible and vulnerable. And we, we've had epidemics before, like, you know, sometimes, I mean, every year, every season, influenza changes a little bit and you know the vaccines that we make we try to keep up with it but but everybody across the board probably has has had some encounter and has some partial immunity to the circulating strains of um, influenza right now and so we're partially protected um, based upon our prior exposures but for this new virus uh, nobody had any immunity at all as far as we can tell so that's the other reason that it's such a uh, such a that has created such a global catastrophe All right so a uh, last question now is that um can schools open safely in september in israel they opened up schools this spring and they had a lot of coronavirus cases and they had to shut everything down do you think that will happen here in the united states yeah that's a hard question um i don't know the answer I think that it, everybody wants kids to go back to school and have in-person instruction um, this fall. I think it, teachers want that. I think parents want that. I think even students want that, right? Maybe they, maybe not all of them, but I think that they, I think that they'd rather see their friends than you know try to stay at home and and do work yeah. online. But um, I think we also recognize that whenever people are coming together. Um, and you know, getting into close contact and the chance of spreading a virus, particularly if somebody didn't have symptoms and didn't know to stay home, that it's a risk for transmission. And even if children, for the most part, and young people, I guess, I mean that you know, anyone college age and and lower, probably it is at relatively low, low risk for having a bad consequence of this virus infection, but they always interact with people who might be more vulnerable than them just based upon older age or other, other medical conditions. So even if kids go back to school and don't get sick, because even if they become an, have a higher risk of infection but don't get sick, their teachers might get sick or their principals might get sick or their, they might bring the virus home to their parents or their grandparents. And and those individuals might suffer as a result. So all of those things are important considerations. I think schools in places where the communities have the epidemic under control and can maintain control, schools will probably reopen, but what happens within schools will probably have to look very different than it did a year ago. Um, and I know people are trying to spend a lot of thoughtful planning in order to, to make that activity um opening of schools happens success but to be honest i don't know what would ha what will happen it's a very very tough problem well as the director do you believe that it is even safe to open i think in some communities it probably is safe to open um i don't i don't really have the responsibility for making those decisions i think those are you know, local government decisions, local school board decisions, maybe maybe governor or state decisions. Um, but I but I don't know the right for for every every community. Thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. That's, sure. That is all the time we have. So um. Okay. Yeah. Much.